I am delighted this evening to welcome Dr. Julia Troche. She is an Egyptologist, historian, and educator, and she earned her PhD in Egyptology from Brown University in 2015, and her BA before that in history from UCLA. She's currently associate professor at Missouri State University in Springfield, Missouri, but we're fortunate to grab her this evening from just down Route 95, down at Brown University, where she's spending some of her sabbatical time. She serves as a governor for the board of the American Research Center in Egypt, RC, and is vice president and co-founder of RC Missouri, and she sits on the American Society of Overseas Research, that's ASOR with its new name, on their Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Her research explores material culture, education in ancient Egypt, contemporary pedagogies of teaching ancient history, and Egyptomania, the obsession and appropriation of ancient Egypt throughout history. Her first book, Death, Power, and Apotheosis in Ancient Egypt, the Old and Middle Kingdoms, was published in 2021. And I'll mention that we covered it in class this morning to rave reviews and positive reactions. And it was published by Cornell University Press. She's currently working on a book about the god Ptah for Bloomsbury, a textbook with Brian Brinkman for Rutledge, and a series of articles on Egyptomania and Imhotep that she hopes to turn into a public-facing book. Tonight, we'll hear something about her research on the living and the dead in ancient Egypt, Dr. Troche. Thank you for everybody who's here in person. Thank you for everybody in, in the internet land. Um, I appreciate everybody who is watching this live or sometime in the future. Um, I wanted to start with a thank you slide. This often comes at the end of lectures, but I think it's important to highlight. I know there's a number of students in the audience, and I think just in general, it's nice to highlight that our scholarship, our research is never done in isolation, and we wouldn't be anywhere without our communities and networks of support. So I really wanna thank um, Peter for having me out, um, Diana for organizing all of this, um, and just everybody on here, all of the institutions that have supported me um, and all the individuals that have done a lot as well to get me here. Um, and of course, our Harvard land acknowledgement statement as well. Um, I also wanted to highlight uh, that um, Claire McCafferty Wright actually designed some of these slides as well, some of the backgrounds. Um, so I just wanted to give her credit to her artistic contribution. She's also an Egyptologist, but an artist as well. So I hope that not too many of you are tuning in, hoping to learn about the living dead and are thinking we're having a lecture on zombies. Um, I purposely, I really wanted my dissertation to be the living dead in ancient Egypt, but for a number of reasons, I did not do that. But um, partly because I love zombie movies, I'm a big fan. <laughs> um, and so we think of the living dead, we think of sort of corporeal, upright, walking, you know, undead creatures, right? So roaming the earth. But for the ancient Egyptians, the, the living and dead meant something a bit different. So what we'll put aside this sort of standard image of the living dead, or it might evoke in our minds that we think of the living dead. And I want to sort of take us to think about what the living dead meant to the ancient Egyptians. So again, a little bit different. Um, we still have a dead that are effective, that are influencing the living, but they are not corporeal, right? They are not upright walking around reanimated corpses. Um, and so when we think about living, um, and we actually have this term in ancient Egyptian texts that are called uh, living dead, akmut, um, or ankmut, excuse me. And these are dead that seemingly are still effective, right? So life and sort of being alive is to be effective, to be part of social networks and to be a part of society and these relationships. That's what makes you alive, not the sort of corporeal form. I want to highlight throughout this talk, um, and I'm not reading it, and so I do apologize if I, um, you know, I'm not as eloquent, but I kind of wanted just to have a conversation with you all and talk sort of through my research rather than reading from a paper tonight. So I want to sort of begin with the highlights, but I hope you take away from this. I want to focus on the dead as social actors whose influences impacted history. So many, so much research, which is valid, I'm not criticizing that research, but so much research focuses on looking at the dead within their mortuary context, within their funerary context. We're thinking about the tomb, how they're buried, processes of mummification, what the afterlife may have looked like, the books of the dead, that sort of thing. And that's not really what my project is. Um, that's a valid area of research, but what I'm really trying to look at is thinking about how the dead in ancient Egypt affected the lives of the living, how they influenced history, 
how they made real impacts, or at least perceived real impacts, on the lived world. So actually taking the dead out of sort of mortuary culture and moving them into history, society, religion, and sort of looking at it through those perspectives. And I want to sort of argue that this is a valid uh, approach, right? A valid methodology. So for example, one of the reasons, one of sort of the outcomes of thinking about the dead as actors is that we can say, and I will argue throughout this talk, that local dead, and I really think the local part of it I'll get into a little bit or can expand upon in Q&A, the local dead become alternatives to the king in the late old kingdom. Um, and in part of this process, I argue they undermine royal mortuary authority um, and contribute to the collapse of the old kingdom. So we think of, you know, the pyramids, this great age of the Egyptian past, and that collapses, that goes away. How in the world did that go away? Well, this is one of these mechanisms, right, that I think contributes to the collapse of the old kingdom. And I think the dead are one of these actors, one of these, and their, their deification, their invocation is one of the phenomena that, or phenomenon that contribute. Um, and so sort of our run of show today, what I, I wanna give you are a little bit of a map of where we're going. Um, I identify in my book and in my research, three categories of, of the dead. The so-called average dead that I associate with the ancient Egyptian term ok, and again, I'll define all of this a little bit more um, in a few slides. The distinguished dead, which are kind of doing something a little bit different. They're a little elevated above the average everyday quotidian dead. And then the deified dead. So these are men, and I do say men because in all instances for my area um, era that I work in, they're all men who have died and were deified. So these are men who lived lives as humans, died, and after death, they became gods, were worshipped as gods by their communities with recognition of their uh, human past, right? So it's not as though they were given, you know, a, a new sort of lineage and they were always divine. Their, their humans or mortal selves were retained in this memory, in this process. And so I'll kind of run through these different layers. I'll talk about the average dead, because before we can talk about how things are distinct or different, we have to first sort of create a baseline, uh, you know, what was what did things kind of normally look like? And then we can talk about how things were different. So I'll talk about the average dead and sort of what normal mortuary culture looked like. I'll then explain how I identify and categorize deified and distinguished dead in the archaeological textual records. Uh, and then I'll give some case studies and examples of those that we can work through temporally from the old through middle kingdoms. Because I also know there are a number of interested folks in the room, graduate students um, in particular, I want to sort of highlight some research along the way as well. Sometimes it'll be my research. There'll be many shameless plugs, I promise you, for my research. Um, but along the way, I'll also highlight some other scholarship that I rely on and work with um, to get to get to this point, right? So, so that way I can't get into all of it right now, but you can kind of go find it and do some more reading on your own. Um, UCLA article, Letters to the Dead, and um, an article I wrote for a volume called The Living Dead at Dear Medina. So I kind of got the title in there somewhere. It couldn't be my dissertation, but I got it in, a, in an article or a book chapter. And then, of course, as mentioned um, at the very beginning, I, this is based in large part, this presentation on my research that comes from my book, um, 2021. There's a QR code on here, but also I just searched my name. It's my only book, so you'll find it. <laughs> my first one for now, um, but I'll be there. And it's called Death, Power, and Apotheosis in Ancient Egypt. So apotheosis is this term that means the process of deification. So when I talk about the deified dead, there are people who underwent apotheosis. They went through this process of divinization, deification, and they became gods. And I'm using all those terms more or less interchangeably. I recognize they're not exactly the same, but for th this purpose, deification, divinization, apotheosis, I'm kind of using more or less as the same thing. I'm sure probably everybody in this room and everybody online knows where Egypt is, but I just kind of wanted to situate ourselves geographically. I'm a big fan of maps and thinking about space um, and place when we're thinking about history. So here is Egypt in Northeast Africa. And if we zoom in, um, for anybody who may not be super familiar, there's going to be a few areas that we're going to look at. Um, primarily, I want to highlight, if, if you're here, you know Giza. I mean, you have the Giza man here, right? So you know about Giza, but I want to highlight that Giza is near the capital. And part of my argument is going to be spatial. And so things are happening a little bit differently near the capital, near where Memphis would have been, near Giza, the cemetery in the Old Kingdom where the pyramids were, right? 
um, versus further away from the capital in the provinces like Thebes and Aswan, things are happening a little bit different. So I kind of want to just highlight some of the places that I'm going to be talking about uh, throughout the lecture. So it sort of, does, again, give us the foundational information, um, bring us sort of what does what does the dead sort of normal average dead look like in ancient Egypt? Well, the ancient Egyptians believed that when you were alive, you had different components of the self. That included your identity or name, the Ren, as it's known in ancient Egyptian. So who you are, uh, your body, right? The corporeal body form that you take in life and then as your mummified remains in death. Your shadow, uh, which is really poorly understood. Uh, there's a few articles talking about it, but nothing really super conclusive. So we don't know exactly, but maybe the shadow as a connection to the sun because you need the sun to have a shadow. So maybe there's something solar there, but again, it's kind of not very well uh, understood. And then two spiritual aspects called the Ba and the Ka. The Ba is depicted as a bird with a human head. It's one of the few animals or creatures in ancient Egyptian mythology and visual culture that has a human head and an animal body. Um, most of the time you'll think of the deities as having human bodies with animal heads, but there's the Sphinx and the Ba that are sort of the two that sort of go a little bit different from that trend and have animal bodies with human heads. And the Ba is a bird, so it's sort of a, a spiritual aspect that is mobile. Um, we think there's debates about this. Um, some people would argue it's not even with you during life, but I follow Jim Allen's reading of a text that says it is with you during life. But in any case, it is the quality that makes you you. It's your personality. It's a spiritual aspect that is sort of like your personality or yourself. And the way that Jim Allen always um, described it in his religion class that I thought was always evocative and always uses example in my classes um, he said that, you know, you pick up your grandfather's watch and, you know, this like sort of memory runs over you. You get this memory of like who your grandfather is. That's the Ba. The Ba is in that watch, right? You kind of have this personality sort of rush over you that you sort of remember who this person is. The Ka, on the other hand, with the K, is more of a life force that's shared among family members. The gods give their Ka to the king. Um, you can have a shared call among people within certain uh, professions. Um, and so it's a spiritual aspect that is shared rather than individualized, where the Ba is more individualized in essence. Um, and the Ka is depicted with these arms, these embracing arms. Um, one of the greatest statues, which is, just looks ridiculous and I love it, right? The statue of horror. Um, the Ka statue just has these arms on top of his head on the far left of the screen, you can see it. Um, but that we think is a statue that's meant to embody his Ka spirit, this life force spirit can live in the statue in death. Um, and the embracing arms is how the Ka is given from, you know, father to son, from king to, you know, his high um, officials, like how the gods give it to the king is through this embrace, through this like physical embrace. Now in death, the dead are, become transfigured. They transform as they enter the afterlife. And so through that process, things about the dead change. So even though, for example, you may not have been literate during life, in death, perhaps you are literate. You may be able to access the spells in your tomb, the Book of the Dead scrolls, even if you weren't literate in life, that process of transfiguration may provide you with sort of different access than you had in life. But for the most part, you want your social capital in life to continue with you into the afterlife. Through that transfiguration process, you want that basically how impressive you are, right? You want that elite status. If you have it in life, you want to bring it with you into the afterlife. Um, and there's a few different ways that that can happen. And an example of sort of this proof of this idea of having sort of efficacy in the afterlife and, and you not just disappearing sort of in death um, from the world of the living I, I love this pyramid text. I think it really encapsulates what I sort of try to try to argue here quite well. Pyramid text 213, this one is King Unas. It says, King Unas, oh, you have not gone away dead. You have gone away alive. You will not perish. You will not cease. Your identity, the Ren, will endure with people, even as your identity comes to be with the gods. So as you die and pass into the divine hereafter, 
you will not perish. You will not cease. You will be remembered. You have not gone away dead. You have gone away alive. So even though despite corporeal demise, despite the death of the body, the dead was still seen as having an alive aspect, right? Uh, an efficacious aspect. And that efficacious aspect is called the ach. So the ach is another supernatural aspect of the dead. You do not have this in life. This is only after that transfiguration process happens. You become ach. You pass through the horizon, the octet, the place of ochification, the place of becoming ach, and you become ach. So as you go from our world into the divine hereafter, you pass through the horizon. That is called the Akhet. That is the place of becoming Ak, and then you become Ak. Um, it is the active agent of the dead. This is the dead in its social capacity. I kind of refer to it sometimes as a ghost-like aspect, but without the sort of menacing qualities. But if you think about how we kind of conceive of the dead still having potential impact on us in our daily lives, that would be the Ak. The place, the sort of locus for the dead is the tomb primarily. Um, the tomb becomes a sort of eternal home for the deceased. So a lot of this invocation may be happening at the tomb, but it doesn't have to happen at the tomb. Um, and so now in sort of, when I talk about invocation, when I talk about the relationship between the living and the dead, for average ancient Egyptian dead, there's a very sort of standard quid pro quo relationship that the living has with their dead ancestors or with their local dead. A really common phrase that we see in a whole lot of tombs um, is this formulaic inscription that says, oh, you, you who are passing by this tomb, may you say an invocation offering of a thousand loaves of bread and a thousand jars of beer for the owner of this tomb. So there's this idea that you need sustenance in order to survive in the afterlife. Yes, you're dead, but you need, you still need sustenance. And actually the word for sustenance is kau, like that spiritual aspect. It's a sort of derivative of that same word. So you need sort of cawness, you need that energy to sustain your aliveness in death. Now, normal living dead interactions, it's a, I give you offerings at important festivals, you sort of help keep me healthy or help me with things, you know, on my end and with the living. We'll see how the distinguished and DFI dead are doing something a little bit different. Um, and so again, so that's kind of the overview. That's the general. Those are big, broad strokes of how mortuary culture and stuff worked in ancient Egypt. I want to kind of zoom in now and think about this as a historical question. So I want to zoom into the old through middle kingdoms. So that includes the old kingdom, pyramid age, first or immediate period is the collapse of that centralized power with many different powers ruling Egypt at one time. And then the middle kingdom is sort of the reunification and the reestablishment of centralized power by kings um, of the 11th dynasty. And I just think this is an interesting way of thinking about royal authority in times of great power and how they lose it, and then how it's regained again, and sort of the different roles of the dead within these different moments historically, I think are, are quite telling. So now I want to talk a little bit, right, about the average dead, distinguished dead, and DFI dead in these historical eras. So everything more or less from here on out will apply to the old through middle kingdoms. A lot of this will also apply to later time periods, but maybe not. So I just want to sort of give those caveats. So what does quotidian everyday mortuary access look like in the old kingdom? Um, I already kind of gave us the broad strokes of that quid pro quo re relationship. And I just want to show that this does indeed, that this is true for the old kingdom and middle kingdom as well um, for that era. So I wanted to give us some evidence that dates that time period. Here's a letter to the dead. Um, this is a great example of why you look at the back of artifacts if you work in a museum and why it's really nice to have artifacts sort of away from the wall so you can see behind them. This is a letter that's written on the back of a, a stela. On the other side of the stela is a beautiful offering scene. And so, you know, that's what you would think is the main part of the stela. And it was, that was originally what it was used for. It was used, reused later to write this letter. And this is a letter written to to the dead, as the as the title implies. The letter writer, this is in the Carlos um, C. Museum in Atlanta, by the way, or Michael C. Carlos Museum, excuse me. Um, the letter writer says, remove the infirmity, the illness of my body. Please become Ach before me, that I might see you fighting on my behalf in a dream. I will then deposit offerings for you. 
So this is great. I, when I found this letter, I'm like, fantastic. It makes explicit the quid pro quo relationship between the living and the dead. And it tells us that the recipient of this request is the AUK. Like, so now we know it for sure. The AUK is a social agent that's being requested for, for mortuary sort of benefaction. Um, and this quid pro quo relationship is really clearly established and made explicit. It's not just, though, what's I think interesting to kind of read into this a little bit more, one more layer. It's not just do something for me and I will do something for you. But there's almost a threat in here. And we see this in some Egyptian, even texts, uh, you know, letters to the gods or invocations of the gods as well. It's remove this illness and then I will deposit offerings for you. The implication is if you don't remove this illness, you may not get your offerings, which means you might not endure in the afterlife. So there's also a little bit of a sort of threatening relationship that we see between the living and the dead. Here's some other, again, relevant publications that I build upon a lot in doing this research. So I'll move through this kind of quickly, but these are sort of things, if you're interested in this research, um, these are other books that you should definitely be, be reading. So sort of the second part of my talk, I want to go through some of the, the framework for how I identify distinguished and DFI dead in the archaeological and textual record. So there's this, these are not standardized, right? So when I sort of started doing this research and I said, look, there's something different happening here. There's the average dead, average living dead relationship, and then other stuff seems to be happening. And so I had to sort of establish what the sort of average normal relationship looked like. And then I could find things that looked different. And so the things that looked different are these markers. So the distinguished dead, what I'm calling distinguished dead, and distinguished dead is a category that is a little bit of a cheat. It are It's people who are more than average, something special is going on, but I don't have positive evidence of their deification. I wonder if some of these were deified, and I don't know if it's like a step, like you are average and then you become distinguished and then you become deified. I, I, you know, I'm not quite sure how it operated, um, to be totally honest. But it's definitely clear there are some people who are special and different, but not fully deified. And the deified dead are doing some things that are distinct on their own. So again, I'm not, I can't say for sure exactly how permeable these boundaries were. Um, and if it was like you had to become distinguished first and then deified, I can't, we don't have the evidence to really sort of lay that out in that level of detail. But I can say that distinguished dead are identifiable by these, by these markers. They retain fame in their local communities. And fame can look different, you know, for different people and can manifest in different ways. I primarily look for textual or epigraphic evidence or archaeological evidence. Um, and I'll explain, I'll give some examples of what that might look like. They're also invoked in what's called the Amahu Kher formula. Um, and the Amahu Kher formula, uh, I won't get into it in super detail because that could be like a whole talk on its own. But there are some recent publications, and again, shameless plug. Um, I'm on sabbatical, so you know I have to talk about all the work I'm doing, right? So uh, I recently wrote um, a, a chapter in a volume that was edited by many people in this room, actually, um, and for in honor as Feshrift in honor of Jim Allen, and he wrote an article called "Some Aspects of the Non-Rural Afterlife in the Old Kingdom," and I wrote an article on some aspects of the non-rural afterlife in the later Old Kingdom as a sort of follow-up um, in a special rift. And in that, we both talk about the Makuhair formula. And I really sort of follow his definition and interpretation of this. This idea that a Makuhair can be translated something as um, one who is favored by. So if we think about an elite member of uh, Egyptian society might be favored by the king, and because of that favoring, because of that position, that closeness that's created, they may get a tomb closer to the pyramid, right? They may get um, access to the royal uh, manufacturing shops that make really nice wooden statues for their tomb, something like that. So it's these relations, these this closeness and relationship um, is expressed. A, a sort of really sort of close, particular mortuary relationship is expressed through that formula. And in almost every instance that we have of this formula in the Old Kingdom, it is always the king who is a makuher of the gods, so the king is favored of the gods, or elites who are favored of the king. 
And there are only a couple instances, like I can count on like one or two hands for, you know, hundreds of years that I found where people were imakuher other people. In those instances, a bunch of them were these distinguished dead and DFI dead. And then there were a few that were, you know, there's one where a woman was a makuher, her husband. There was one where a man was a makuher, the people. Um, but they they seem to be very rare. So it does seem like this was something that the king kind of had that was special. Um, the gods, you know, sort of favored him and then he would favor his people. So what I am sort of wondering then, part of my research, is what happens when you can get that same mortuary favor from Joe down the road and you don't have to go to the king. And so that's where I sort of see the distinguished dead creeping in a little bit to the king's mortuary hierarchy. And again, I'll expand on that a little bit more in a few slides. Uh, the distinguished dead can also, um, as I said, have textual fame. So a lot of them are invoked in these songs of the great sages. Um, so there are men in ancient Egypt who are remembered for their wisdom, um, for being, you know, these great sort of, you know, people like Imhotep, who was, you know, an architect and, uh, you know, a medicine man or people who just were remembered as being really smart and having written instruction texts. Um, and so here we have Chester BD4. This is kind of one of the more famous texts. And you can say, um, you can see that it says, a man is dead, his corpse is in the ground. When all of his family are laid in the earth, it is his writing that lets him be remembered in the mouth of the reciter of the formula. So even though you die, your memory endures by people repeating your writing, which is kind of a beautiful idea. It goes on to say, is there anyone here like Horjedaf? Is there anyone here like Imhotep? Or is there another like Imhotep? They hid their powers from the whole land, meaning like while they were alive, and they put them, they sort of embedded the secret knowledge in their teachings and their writings. They're gone, their names might be forgotten, but their writings let them be remembered. Archaeological evidence of fame um, can come from tomb clustering or the upkeep, for example, of Ka Chapel. So again, that Ka is that spiritual aspect, and you want to sustain that spiritual aspect. And so a chapel may be erected to the Ka of someone who's died. And here we just have some examples of these governors of a city called Ayan Azal. And the governors have these call chapels that just become these like huge monuments in the community. There's a massive fire that destroys most of them and then they're rebuilt. And it really becomes kind of like the pyramids are the sort of center focal point for a community around which sort of power and hierarchy is sort of organized, these Ka chapels seem to operate in really similar ways. Um, obviously quite different, but still similar. And so here we have King Pepi II, one of sort of the last powerful kings of Dynasty VI before the Old Kingdom collapses. Um, perhaps it's already probably collapsing during his reign or power is sort of breaking apart. Um, but he grants the, the Hoot Ka, he grants this Ka chapel to the governors of, of Ayan Azal. So, so these are just the, the categories. These are just the identifying markers. Um, and then I'll get into, again, sort of what this all means in, in future slides. How do we identify DFI dead? So all the same things for distinguished dead. DFI dead can have those. But the things that make them unique is they might be an actor in festival. They may have their own priesthood. They may have a shrine dedicated to them that could be at their tomb or away from their tomb. Uh, theophoric names may invoke them. I'll explain what that means um, in a few slides as well, but in short, I'll give an example of it rather. Um, but Theo, like God, so a name, a private name that invokes a God um, is basically what that's saying. And if you have all these formula in which you invoke the God and all of a sudden somebody who's not a God shows up in that spot, that might be evidence that they actually are considered to be a God. The Hetepti Nesut offering formula is a, another funerary formula. It's an offering that the king gives. And usually this is interpreted as the right to have a tomb next to the king's pyramid or something to that effect. So again, it's another way of showing closeness in a particular relationship that is mortuary, that's based in mortuary culture. And, you know, shocking sometimes, <laughs> people forget about this one, just being called a god. Netcher is the ancient Egyptian term for god. And so I argue if you are called a god, or identified as one by divine determinative following your name, that means you were perceived as God. Like to me, that seems pretty straightforward. You'd be surprised though, it's not straightforward to everybody. So this is sort of the 
getting into the historical implications of all of this, right? So that's my methodology. That's my categories, my framework, how I identify them now. Like, why do we care? What do they tell us? So in the old kingdom, at the beginning of the old kingdom, you have the living, you have the divine hereafter. You don't want to just die and go nowhere. You want to live your life eternal. You want to get to the divine hereafter. The only way you can really do that is through your relationship with the king. Now, probably everybody still had access to a hereafter, but if you want the really nice, fancy afterlife, you need the king's help to get there. And this is something I sort of struggle with. It's like, well, you know, if you just died and you're an average person in ancient Egypt, you probably also believed in an afterlife. And we have tombs and burials that aren't particularly, you know, lavish that implies people believed in an afterlife, even if you weren't, you know, second in command or prince or something like that. But if your life continues, you, you know, it's more, you have more to lose if you are an elite, if you're a chati, a second in command, you have all this, these riches, you have all of this privilege. You want that privilege in the afterlife for eternity. And so you have to get that through the king. There are some other intermediaries though in the old kingdom that would allow you to kind of access the gods. You can call upon them. You know, there are lesser deities. There are deities of the gnomes of the cities. There are other ways that you can sort of invoke and call upon the gods directly or indirectly. Um, but it's really the king is the primary actor here who gives you the full benefits of a fully sort of realized afterlife. The way that we see this in the archaeological and textual records is the Amaku Hare relationship. That formula tells us about that relationship that allows you to get access to the full privileges of the afterlife. And you really want to talk to the king and you want to have that close relationship to the, with the king to have those full privileges of the afterlife. You invoke these other intermediaries, like the average dead, if it's lesser issue things. Like this is eternal life. Eternal life, you, you need to talk to the king. You need to get that Amaku hair relationship down. If you're just like, you know, you have COVID, you, not to undermine it, but you have a flu, you have COVID, you have an issue with fertility, you can't get pregnant, um, there's an inheritance issue. Those are things that maybe the king doesn't want to hear about. And so you're going to go to your local dead. You're going to go to other intermediaries for those concerns. But issues of paramount importance, like getting into the afterlife and having eternal, you know, privilege in the afterlife, that's something at the beginning of the old kingdom, only the king can give you, or so I argue. This is manifest physically by how close you are buried to his pyramid. So we have what's called the nucleus principle. The closer you are to the pyramid, sort of more important you are and sort of potentially more fully you can engage in that sort of shared capital in the afterlife. Um, and here, this is when I was in Egypt a few years ago, you can just see how close some of these elite tombs are. Um, sometimes it's been described, the Maku hair formula is described as, you know, being favored by the king means that you are literally in the shadow of his association. Um, and in this case, the tombs are literally physically in the shadow of the pyramid. Like they're so close. This association is like so connected um, that you literally, are, the shadow is cast upon these, these tombs. Um, and you can see, I think this image really sort of shows just how close you can get to the actual pyramids if you have the rights or relationship with the king. Now in the later half of the old kingdom, some things start changing. You still go to your local and ancestral dead for issues of fertility, of illness. And you can still go to the king to get that Imaku hair formula to access the full privileges of the afterlife. But all of a sudden, there's all of these new actors who can also grant you full privileges to the afterlife. And those are the distinguished and deified dead. So in dynasties five and six, to so the latter sort of half of the old kingdom, there seems to be an uptick in folks that can provide you with the same benefits that the king previously had a monopoly on. This role that was once unique to the king, mortuary benefactor, the one who could get you eternal life. I mean, that's a big deal, eternal life. Now other people can also get you eternal life with these great benefits, with these privileges. Because we now have people who are choosing to say that they are Omahu hair, these other folks instead of the king. And they're choosing to bury themselves closer to these other folks' tombs instead of the king's tombs. I think then that these local and distinguished dead kind of 
elbow out the king a little bit. Maybe the king is already, you know, his, his influence may be already collapsing and they just sort of fill up that vacuum that has presented itself. Or maybe they are an expanding balloon that's pushing out the king from this sort of diagram. I don't know that part. I can't tell which one chicken or egg kind of came first. But what I can say is by the end of the old kingdom, the king and his relationship to individuals in power, like local elites, he's no longer the primary vehicle that's getting them into the fullest privileges of the afterlife. It's other folks instead. Now, what's going to happen? We're going to have an intermediate period. There's going to be some, you know, uncentralized, decentralized power throughout Egypt. Kings of the Middle Kingdom are going to reunify this, but they have this problem. And in the Middle Kingdom, the kings are going to sort of push themselves back into this, right? They're going to sort of reclaim some of this power and authority from the local distinguished dead. So I want to look at some case studies. So now we know sort of my general argument, the historical implications of it, how I'm identifying these folks, and how this is different from typical average mortuary culture. What does this actually look like in practice? Um, and so here are some, a few case studies. I know you can't read this, but this is just to give you an overview of the sort of scheme I use. So this is a whole chart where on the top, um, I lay out all of the different uh, characteristics of distinguished or DFI dead, the markers I call them. And then these are folks I found sort of examples of that have some of these markers in the old through middle kingdoms. So we'll look at just a few. So we'll start with Horjedef. So Horjedef, you can see, has like two ticks next to his name. Um, he is a distinguished dead because he does not have any of the markers of apotheosis on the right side of the screen. He is invoked um, in fame. So he is sort of remembered later and he is invoked in the Makuher formula. So those are sort of his markers. Who is Horjedef? Um, he's also sometimes referred to as Jedef Hor, um, probably actually more accurately Jedef Hor. But he's a fourth dynasty son of Khufu. Um, he's distinguished during the Old Kingdom. So around the time in which he died, he is then distinguished pretty soon after his death and at least through the Ramesid era. So we're talking, you know, I don't know, roughly 2700 through 1200 BCE. So for over millennia, there's evidence for his fame, for his memory sort of being invoked. As I said, here's the evidence we have for him. He's evoked in that formula, the Makuher formula. We have literary fame um, and epigraphic fame for him. Now, I can't tell you that he was never deified. So I can tell you, I'm, I'm referring to him as a distinguished dead of the old kingdom. I don't know if he was a deified dead, but I have no positive evidence that he was deified. I, all I can say is that he was at least distinguished. And just an example of like what I mean by epigraphic fame, he was included in the Wadi Hamamat. There's all these sort of inscriptions, there are all these graffiti there. And he's included in this list of fourth dynasty kings. So there's all these kings, their names are written in cartouches, um, and his name is included among those. He was never king um, that we know of. Um, so there's nothing to confirm that unless, you know, there's something I don't know. Um, but he was included among these other kings, which suggests that he had people remembering him as a pretty important guy um, by including him alongside here. Photo on the right, it's kind of hard to see, so I have the line drawings on the left. And Horjedef is the second one in from the left. So if you start at the left, you count one, two, there you have Horjedef, Horjedef four. So another deified dead called Gimni, um, or sorry, sorry, this is a deified dead now. So we went to distinguished, now we're looking at deified. He was a Chati, a second in command during the reign of the sixth dynasty, King Teddy. Um, he was buried, not hurried at Saqqara, but he was buried at Saqqara, which is um, near the capital. Um, and he is distinguished in the Old Kingdom, and he's deified by the end of the Old Kingdom. Um, so during the Old Kingdom, right around his life and death, he is definitely distinguished. And before the Old Kingdom's over, he's deified as well. So pretty quickly, he is deified. He's also invoked in a Makuher formula. Um, there is evidence of tombs clustering around his tomb, like people clustered their tombs around the King's Pyramid. And he's also invoked in these texts of literary fame. Um, and there are theophoric names that invoke him. So here, this is an example of that tomb clustering. His tomb is in blue, so sort of the middle big block on there, the box in the middle of the screen. If I apologize if you're colorblind. Um, but in blue here, sort of in the middle of the screen, that's his tomb. And then sort of an L shape around his tomb are all of these subsidiary tombs that 
um, are clearly clustering around his. And we know that they're clustering around his because a lot of them have inscriptions and have, you know, some of them are named after him. They're, they're named Gimni or Kagimni. So they're invoking him in their names or they have a stila that invoke him and say things like, I am a Mahu Her, you know, the dignitary, the vizier, the Chati, Kagimni. So their folks are clearly identifying their worth by their relationship to him, just like elites did to the king earlier in the old kingdom. So I said I'd describe um, theophoric names in a little bit clearer terms. So names in ancient Egypt often invoked either gods or kings. Um, sometimes they just invoked, you know, places or other things. Um, but if you invoke a king, a name is called basilophoric. And if you invoke the gods, it's called a theophoric construction. Um, and often people have a main name and a nickname. Um, so they, so for Kagimni, it's Kagimni is his full name. And then Gimni is like his nickname. We have these constructions that are clearly what I say are theophoric. So they are a variable place where you can put any God's name. And then there's sort of some other phrases to go with it. So for example, one you may be familiar with, Amun Imhat. Amun is at the four. Imhat means at the front. So you can have Amun Imhat, you can have Aten Imhat, you can have, you know, Ta Imhat, you can put in, a, but it always is a divine name. Well, we have examples of Gimni Imhat. Right around the time in which, and clustering around his tomb, right around the time in which he lived and died, we have people who seem to be invoking him explicitly as a god. And if you want to know more about naming structures, there's great UCLA Encyclopedia of Egyptology articles. These are really accessible, usually fairly short reads that just give you the breakdown of a topic and then a lot of um, publications for further research. All right, so again, we're in the Old Kingdom. We're at the end of the Old Kingdom and we start seeing people who are deified and distinguished and they're sort of taking the place that was once exclusively reserved for the king. So in conclusion for the Old Kingdom, we have cults that materialize near the capital where there was a larger reliance on royal benefaction for mortuary assurances or access. So the king was really established up there and the way that he defined his relationship with others was through these mortuary relationships. And so that's the same sort of thing that these DFI dead and distinguished dead are doing. They're sort of just mirroring what he was doing before. Cults are more readily realized. So apotheosis happens really fast after one's death. I argue because, again, this, this framework is in place. And so it's really easy for them to sort of jump in and do the same thing. But the cults are kind of modest in form. Um, so there's sometimes more like insinuation of their divine status rather than like big temples being built and it being like really in your face. And I argue in my book that the conservative expression of these cults could be explained by their proximity to the capital where activity was perhaps restricted by prescriptive norms of elite decorum, basically saying that they, they were taking on roles of the king, but they couldn't do it in a really obvious way, right? They're trying to kind of subtly take over the role of the king without saying like, I'm the king. And so they had to sort of keep it a little bit, a little bit on the down low. Now let's see what's happening. One example that I'll be quick of the middle kingdom. So Hekaib, you can see, is one of the best examples here because he has like almost everything. Like he hits like almost all of the markers. Every example just about, you know, every sort of marker of divinization or distinction, he's there. He's a Dynasty Six official. He was buried at Kubit al-Hawa. So he's out um, near Aswan in the provinces. So now we're talking about away from the capital. And he's definitely deified by the Middle Kingdom. Um, and he may have been deified in the first intermediate period um, earlier as well. He has a full on shrine dedicated to him at, at Aswan, at, on the island of Elephantine. So there's, a, there's numerous stila here. There's a whole shrine complex all dedicated to him in his divinized form. At this shrine complex, so an image of which on the right you see part of the shrine complex, there are statues to him, there are stila that invoke him, and they say things like, O oh, Wab priests of the noble Hekaib, he shall repay his answer always, because a god is not ignorant of he who nourishes him. A god, meaning Hekaib, is not ignorant of the priests that give him offerings. 
So they're calling him a, calling him a god. Um, we have a statue, like the one you see here um, in the middle and in the shrine. And on the side of the statue, rather actually by the feet there, you see he is called, um, somebody is saying, look, I'm a mahu hair. I am favored by the Necher Niuti, by the local god, the god of the city. So again, he's explicitly called a Necher, a god in this instance. He has a shrine right in the middle of the city here. So you can see sort of the top part clustered in green um, is the city and the residential quarters. And then you have residential quarters in the bottom as well. In blue, also kind of on the bottom, are the other temples um, of this site, the Satat Temple and the Kanum Temple. And then right in the middle, in the center of all of that, you have the sanctuary, what this calls a sanctuary, what I call a temple to Hekaib. So what I argue then from evidence like Hekaib's is that cults in the Middle Kingdom take longer to materialize. He wasn't deified immediately after his death in the Sixth Dynasty. It took a while for him to fully take on all of this sort of divinized form. And I think perhaps that's because the king's declining power didn't matter as much in the provinces. So sometimes like when I talk about the Amarna period and I talk about, you know, the closing of temples or I talk about, you know, the change in ideology, I have students who ask things like, how much does that affect people day to day? That must have been a huge, you know, big transformation. I'm like, maybe or maybe not. Sometimes what the 10% kind of do matters to each other a lot more than it actually matters down below. Because people's day-to-day -day is still kind of doing the same thing. It just is for Aten instead of Amun. Like to some degree, some things may have been more or less kind of similar. And so I think in the provinces, maybe they were less reliant on the king in the first place. And they're more used to dealing with things locally. And so they didn't need someone to come in and save them when the king's power sort of went away. They already had systems in place to sort of take care of themselves, to get divine mortuary access, et cetera. And so it took a little bit longer for these for these cults to really sort of take fuller shape. Um, I, but when they take fuller shape, they are explicitly called upon as gods. Temples are built and they have a much more popular veneration. Their, their veneration is much bigger than anybody earlier and in the North. I think this is in parallel to a rise in the first intermediate period of temple structures of power, of hierarchy. So where we have in the old kingdom, we have this king and he's very much defining his power through the funerary system. In the first intermediate period, the king's no longer there to do that. And instead we see temples kind of coming in to save the day. Your local temple is now taking care of you, right? Your local temple is a redistributive economy. They're making sure you're fed without you know, a unified king to rule all of Egypt. There are local folks who are usually tied to the temple. The mayors are often also priests of the temple that are kind of taking care of you. And so power starts sort of taking shape and defining itself through temple hierarchy. And so the cults of the middle kingdom look a little bit more like that temple hierarchy. So they're sort of playing into different webs of power. Now, this is where I'll end. This is my, my last um, slide here, is that despite all of this and kind of justifying this whole project is that not for when I first started this project, I'm like, oh, well, obviously these guys were deified. Obviously there's distinguished and deified dead and they're doing important things. But people really had a hesitancy against believing this. And I think part of that is maybe like a Judeo-Christian like hesitancy for thinking that people can just become a God. Um, and, you know, we, I, I want to sort of use this as a last moment to really sort of think, remind us, we have to think emically about what the ancient Egyptians, sort of how they perceived their world. So Hekaib, I showed you, he had like every sort of marker was clicked. He was called a God explicitly a local god a god on multiple monuments <laughs> and we still have people like Gotika who says Hekaib cannot be said to have been deified because he had no cult and you know I argue that a lot of gods in Egyptian pantheon didn't have full fully formed cults so Geb and Newt Geb the god of earth Newt the sky goddess fundamental deities, fundamental creator deities of the sort of early created world. We cannot deny that they are gods, but they didn't have a lot of shrines. They didn't have a lot of priests. They didn't have a lot of people going to their temples and worshiping them. And so I don't think those are things that you have to have to be a god in ancient Egypt. And so just to summarize, hopefully throughout this talk, we learned a bit about 
the dead as effective social actors and why it's worthwhile studying them and their perceived efficacy outside of mortuary culture and the mortuary sphere. We can observe political, social, and religious and historical impacts that the dead actually had on the real world of the living in ancient Egypt. And I sort of have this last slide again, as I said, as a reminder for prioritizing emic perspectives. Because I think for too long in the scholarship, we sometimes are hesitant to agree to ideas that may conflict with our own, but that may not have conflicted with the ancient Egyptians. We have to sort of always remind ourselves of that. Um, so with that, I will end. Thank you very much for your time.